Before I begin, I want to just uh, put a thank you out there to all of the different uh, teams at Cockroach Labs who've helped to organize this event. Uh, a gathering of so many people from around the world to New York City is a really Herculean effort. And also thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, we actually have uh, a great number of customers and partners here. Uh, thank you for making the time. It's really uh, humbling to, to um, see your participation and uh, from all different uh, kinds of companies and, and use cases and roles. Uh, using CockroachDB, it's uh, quite a journey we've been on for nine years to get to this point. Uh, we're going to do our best, of course, to make this conference worth your effort and your time. So today, what I want to talk about in this keynote is the value of partnership. Uh, we always have aimed to differentiate in this capacity. And this is one of the areas that uh, a smaller, single-threaded focus, just building a database and just doing it for some of the world's most innovative companies, uh, this is an area where we can invest and really um, be a different kind of vendor, a different kind of partner for our customers. So our customers use our product not to just do banal or mundane things with databases, but to make things that are impractical or even impossible possible with this technology. So they're pushing the envelope, all of you are, uh, with data, you know, fundamentally to lead in your respective markets. And we're there to support you in that journey. We actually, uh, the co-founders of Cockroach and the early teams, we had the good fortune, really, to use CockroachDB and to design it, to conceive of it, to solve our own problems. And that's always the best way to start a company. You want to be the first customer. So this idea of a customer perspective, this is really uh, from the very, very beginning. I think it helps to give you a little bit of background on, on how we came to the um, concept of Cockroach and why we decided to actually take the, the leap in, into a you know, now almost decade-long effort to build this system. Our journey started at Google in 2002, and actually the three co-founders, we all started within three months of each other. It's been a very long partnership. Uh, at Google, we immediately ran into problems. They were struggling with scale and resilience, among other things. They had built a lot of read-only kind of databases and indexes in order to access or index the entire web. But they were actually starting to need um, reads and writes. They wanted to mutate these uh, indexes. And actually, um, we're, we're also starting kind of more traditional applications. AdWords was a big one in 2002. That was a new application. And as you can imagine, it was experiencing exponential growth. So they started with one MySQL database, and then they went to two, and they sort of manually split it. Everyone here is familiar with that journey. Uh, and then they went to four, and then to eight. And in these different scaling steps, they started running into all kinds of different problems. Too many connections to the database. It's still a problem that we, that we have, actually. Uh, and then they had, for example, uh, uh, too many users. And so they had to uh, figure out how to uh, avoid these, what they called all shards queries that went out to every single shard in the system in order to look up uh, a user, not by their user ID, but by uh, some other piece of information like an email address. And those were bringing the system down because they had, at that point, I think 16 shards. It was just too many of these fan out queries that were happening. So we had to build uh, you know, some solutions for that. I got thrown into this team, and it was a, 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 every single morning they had a war room, is what they called it. And we were struggling with the latest fire trying to put it out as that system was scaling. And eventually they uh, went from, I think, to 32 shards. They had, a, they had to define their own table type or underlying storage in the system in order to handle a table that was too big in order to offload some of the data. It was, it was quite a journey. And that 32 shards is kind of where I exited that project. They actually went to 1,000 before they were able to uh, replace that system. And they finally replaced that system through a long string of uh, evolution in how they built databases. They started with Bigtable, and that was really led to NoSQL. Uh, but interestingly enough, at Google, two years after that, they realized that they uh, needed a, a different kind of system. They built something called Megastore, which had some limited transaction support. But, uh, and also it used Paxos, so it had consensus replication. So they're kind of on that journey. But then they found that that wasn't good enough, and they started to conceive of Spanner, which was about a five-year uh, development cycle before they first got it into production. And it didn't have SQL. But then they quickly realized, we need to get rid of this AdWords system that was now 1,000 shards. And so they added SQL on top of that. So it was a kind of like full circle. And that really did serve as the inspiration for uh, CockroachDB. We were, uh, had a front row seat in that database evolution. We saw all of those decision points and the, and, and the whole solution space. And, and Google's journey was very instructive. 
But it wasn't until we left Google and uh, all three of us started a company called Viewfinder, which was private photo sharing. And interestingly enough, at Google, we weren't just in infrastructure. We built some applications. We worked on Gmail and Google Reader and uh, you know, some other ones. And so we kind of, we kind of split our time between uh, building applications and building infrastructure. And it's kind of this uh, evolution, each pushing the next uh, to a new height. Uh, at Viewfinder, we were now out of the safe Google Nest with all of their evolved technology. And we realized that the world outside of Google had open source technologies that weren't as advanced as what Google had done internally. And our ambitions for this private photo sharing startup really would benefit from some of the capabilities that they'd build into Bigtable and into Megastore and into Spanner. So we wanted that scale, and we wanted to worry about what happens when we have users across the Atlantic. Are we just going to fetch the data transatlantically to, from, from one single database? We want this to feel like a logical system, but we want to partition the database. How about PII? We were actually worried about that in 2012, and we realized that uh, all of these problems required a different kind of architecture for the database. We didn't build a database in Viewfinder, but we thought about it. <laughs> we are ultimately trying to build a, a private photo sharing company. Uh, we actually started it. We wrote a manifesto for this system, uh, and that's where the name came from. <clears throat> But ultimately, we worked on the system. We used DynamoDB in 2012. It was new, it just came out. We spent about a third of our total engineering time dealing with the lack of transactions in that. And so that experience, when we were acquired two years later by Square, really informed our perspective. And at Square, we saw a whole new set of problems with databases, different from Viewfinder, different than Google. They were using HBase. They were sharding databases manually. They were building kind of one-off consensus replication systems uh, that uh, honestly were very difficult to maintain. Uh, so we also looked at some of the exodus of ex-Google people that had gone to Pinterest and Yelp and Dropbox. And we heard stories about their own struggles with databases. And we realized, at least in the tech ecosystem, wow, it was time for a, a, a new open source database that really had these kinds of capabilities. And, and thus, we uh, decided to start the project, and eventually, that uh, uh, propelled us into actually starting the company. We built these first versions for workloads that we understood deeply. But even though we had you know, knowledge of Google's workloads and Square's workloads and our, our uh, workload at uh, Viewfinder, we were surprised by our earliest customers, by the diversity of their workloads and the different requirements that they brought uh, to the table that they needed us to help them solve. Uh, it was just this incredible diversity and breadth. And, and that has only deepened as time has gone by, and still we get customers that surprise us with some of their requirements. This slide is just a subset of our customers. We have over 200. Uh, but I think these are uh, some of the logos that, um, when you look at them, you realize there's some commonalities. These are some of the world's most ambitious technology companies, whether they're small and early in their journey or they're are quite uh, scaled, and they're um, really building uh, products and applications that people rely on every day uh, to, to get through uh, the modern world. Some, I, I think some of these are new product categories entirely. Some are new markets that they're defining. Uh, there's also, I think, a common theme where they're defining new ways of uh, doing whatever they're doing that are industry shaping for the larger ecosystem they're in. And they, they fundamentally use data to differentiate, and that helps them lead in their respective markets. Also often have globally distributed and scaling user bases. And uh, sometimes the app itself is the business. And so you can imagine that downtime in that application is extremely uh, consequential for brand and actually uh, the bottom line. To win, though, as, especially as they're starting to reach scale, they still have to worry about optimization. They still have to worry about the total cost of ownership. And so that efficiency is a concern in addition to all the new capabilities that they desire. What we found with these customers is that when we make them successful, we succeed. That is the, that's the ground truth. And that's, that's an obvious truth, but it's something you have to live and breathe every day. So of those customers, we've got quite a few of them that are actually going to be presenting in this conference and, and, and a couple besides that are not on this slide. And, and I think this is uh, an opportunity, this conference, it was last year, uh, for everyone to learn from their respective journeys. They have exciting stories. And actually, I was deeply inspired last year to hear these stories, because these, the content of these stories, it's actually somewhat hard to, to, to get all of those details uh, throughout the normal course, even with customer success, helping them through their workloads. We don't always get all the information, and this is an opportunity to get a really inside look from the customer's perspective. And it's extremely valuable, and I hope that it'll inspire all of us. So what I want to speak about is our commitment to partnership. 
And, and ultimately, what that commitment means and how important it is when things don't go as planned. So Cockroach should be one of our primary strengths is that we run virtually everywhere. Uh, and certainly, it feels like that. Uh, there's countless environments, countless deployment configurations. We have public clouds, all of the public clouds. We've got private clouds, of course, and increasingly hybrid. We even have a customer that's going to speak at this conference that's running actively with replication sites in each of the three major public clouds. So that's a, that's a pretty um, stunning kind of survivability. It lets you uh, uh, survive an entire cloud outage. Not just a regional, but the entire cloud if there's some kind of misconfiguration or systemic risk. And I think that that kind of thought leadership is going to provide a new standard, especially in certain financial uh, you know, uh, verticals like financial services. The database, though, doesn't work in isolation. And there's a lot of complexity in the layers below it and the layers above it. And there's unbounded complexity in application use cases and the requirements that they demand from the database. And we depend on all kinds of infrastructure layers beneath us. Uh, sometimes that's very unique. It's custom built in private data centers. Uh, sometimes it's just the like, you know, profoundly diverse set of infrastructure and that's constantly evolving in the public clouds. You, these things can fail, and they do fail. And they do it in unique ways that are very By the way, these aren't new problems for databases. Of course, every database deals with this. But the complication that's especially true for Cockroach is what happens with all of these things that can go wrong when you're actually dealing with massive scale or latency you know, that uh, is com com uh, compounded by geographic distances. Uh, there's security, especially when you start getting into these uh, more rarefied verticals, security requirements that uh, uh, most, most startups never worry about. But boy, they add up. You get an 800-question 800 uh, question survey for your <laughs> security uh, footprint. And you have to answer every single one of those questions. And you have to often build in order to make those answers uh, acceptable. And especially, our customers are looking for resilience. So that's, that's the uh, origin of our name. That's one of our, our key brand promises. All of those requirements do make these interdependent, interrelated problems with the different layers of infrastructure above and below uh, especially uh, difficult. So we found that these challenging production issues, they fall into a, a number of different themes. And I'm just going to talk about some of them. Uh, one that you're going to hear quite a few of in these customer, uh, these partnership stories I'm going to tell is about new requirements. So how quickly can we build to purpose when someone, uh, some use case or a, a, a prospect uh, comes to us with a requirement that is just do or die for their workload or for their, their vertical or for their business? So I mentioned all of the interdependencies of these layers of infrastructure. When failures happen in those complex interactions, can we diagnose and find workarounds and ultimately improve our product so we don't have to diagnose it again? Either the observability is transparent, or we simply make the product bulletproof to that kind or that class of errors. And then there's the tail latency, so like this predictability of the performance of the system, especially when you have massive scale or you have uh, really like uh, cross-continental operations in your use case. Can we understand those workloads? And that's a critical point, which I'll touch on again. We want to solve uh, for the customer. We want to understand what the workload's trying to accomplish, what the requirements are. And we want to, we want to find a solution. Sometimes that is the environment they're running it and uh, how we can tune it or configure it. Sometimes that's just other features in the database, something that needs to be enabled, something that already exists. And that's where we can really help our customers, uh, I think, most expediently. And then other times, you do have to get back to how do we improve the database? How do we add something that's fundamentally useful and missing? So these deep partnerships, they're an absolutely crucial part of all of our customers' success journeys. When I look at our most successful companies, our customers, they are the ones that have invested in this partnership with us. I've anonymized all these stories. Some of them we, we could use the logo, some we couldn't. But I think it's best to just kind of focus on the, the depth of the partnership and what we've accomplished together. Uh, you're going to hear from some of these companies. Uh, and um, I think that uh, for the purpose of my talk, that's, that's less important than really kind of digging down and saying, you know, what happens when things don't go as planned? How do we respond? How do we jump into action and really put in that investment to solve the problem? So this is a, a customer that does sports betting in the US. And that sports betting uh, is governed by something called the Wire Act. And the Wire Act stipulates that if you're going to process a bet, you have to do it within the state lines where the bet was placed. 
So as you can imagine, this is a complex challenge. In particular, there's uh, really difficult issues with concurrent sporting events if you, if you need to do it in all the different uh, places where those concurrent events are happening at once, at scale. So ideally, for this use case, the database has to tie the data to the locations because you want to have one single truth, uh, source of truth, one logical database. Because customers, uh, customer accounts and uh, so forth can uh, you know, uh, migrate between states and so forth, it's very hard to keep that all consistent and up to date uh, across regions if you have a separate database in each one of them. Uh, so in partnership with this customer, we actually created a truly unique topology, I think one that uh, still is unique uh, out there for our, for our customers. And that's across seven regions and soon to be eight, so quite a few regions. And we optimized with a lot of load testing before we ever deployed into production to eliminate bottlenecks. And there were, there were quite a few because this kind of scale in terms of multi-region was new to us when we, when we launched this use case. We also really leaned in with this customer on migrating their legacy application that was really built for a, a more monolithic, from a more monolithic perspective. And we didn't just suggest a larger rewrite. This is a very iterative process with the customer. Uh, in order to make this a, um, a, a, a a migration with a much higher chance of success that could be done in, with a, you know, a reasonable resource expenditure. So they were always finding uh, compromises that were suitable, that met their requirements, uh, and also played to the strengths of CockroachDB. So this was things like primary key revisions, as we needed the primary key to represent the geographic region. Also, how we could uh, segregate the workloads to, to better effect and how we could limit schema change uh, uh, recommendations so that they were really just got to the, the heart of the matter without requiring too many changes to the application. And also, of course, query fine-tuning, cross-region queries and so forth. So this partnership had also very important benefits for Cockroach Labs as a company. We actually uh, had to, the, for the first time, make extensive use of AWS outposts, which is where you have local data center machines that are managed through the AWS control plane. That was new for us, and it really advanced our capabilities with hybrid deployments, uh, particularly heterogeneous uh, you know, kinds of configurations and in, in nodes in the, in the cluster, and of course, many regions. And I'll say that during many uh, NFL Sundays, there were a lot of Cockroach Labs employees with their laptops open, uh, ready to support that customer. Here's another customer, and this is a very early adopter, and uh, what they work on is access management. They were also one of our very first cloud customers. So they were, uh, in 2018, they were using Cockroach, which was pretty early. That was about the, the first year we really went to market. And what they absolutely need to do is allow their customers to unlock doors, which requires access to the system, even uh, in the face of any conceivable outage. Uh, they required multi-active replication, of course, to do this because they wanted a zero recovery point objective. Uh, this early version of CockroachDB, uh, the geopartitioning was pretty new at that point in time. And it had a very complex configuration. So if you wanted to, do, uh, to, to, to really do multi-region uh, and, and uh, do it correctly to survive um, you know, these uh, large class of different outages they were concerned about, it was very complex. It required hundreds of lines of configuration changes. Uh, so that was not optimal, and it became a big priority for this customer. So we leaned in with them, and that actually led us to define uh, what we call survival goal. This is an abstraction, and it really gets to the heart of what the customer is looking for. What do you want to survive? Is it a zone failure? Is it a region failure? And nowadays, is it a cloud failure? Uh, so th that's actually uh, been extremely helpful, and from hundreds of lines of configuration changes, we moved to several SQL commands in order to get there. Uh, this partnership also extended beyond just these survival goal abstractions. They actually uh, really helped us with some advanced features around change data capture and time to live, or TTL. So another early cloud customer. This is uh, a customer that uh, does in identity infrastructure for the internet. And they really had stringent security requirements. I think uh, we've, we've, we've continued to see, uh, I think, an, an, a ratcheting of those security requirements. So this is an early one. They required customer-managed encryption keys. They were also a, a, a cloud customer. And what they needed to do was, in, uh, this is an early version of uh, CMEK, customer-managed encryption keys, in the cloud. And it required a migration of an existing database that didn't have the data encrypted with the customer's keys to a new database that would actually have that data encrypted at rest. And that actually was going to, in the normal course of doing things in that sort of early version, require a migration that would have 20 minutes of downtime. 
And that 20 minutes of downtime was utterly unacceptable to this customer. So again, we leaned in on this partnership. And this took our customer success team uh, really to, to you know, put their heads down and innovate and find ways to use a, a restore and then our CVC sync tool in order to have a seamless, though manual, uh, migration with uh, no downtime. And that actually, uh, and again, it's like these partnerships that have very bi-directional benefit. That led us to a uh, really informed migration strategy that was based on uh, specific customer needs. We, we see this again and again. If you, if you design for everyone, <laughs> it's very hard to get something that works for anyone. When you start with a, one customer and you make them very successful, that's a great foundation to build on. Uh, so this actually led us to our suite of what we call MOLT tools, which is another one of these cockroach word plays. Uh, but MOLT actually is an acronym that stands for Migrate Off Legacy Things. That's actually one of my favorites. Uh, but this is really a great instance of our roadmap reprioritization. Really, we, we jumped in there. We recognized this as an exigent need for an important customer. And uh, what we also found is that exigent need was really the tip of the iceberg was the tip of the iceberg, the bigger iceberg, was emerging needs of the same sort for a much larger class of customers, newer ones that were arriving, existing ones that were also getting to the same point and having the same requirements. And this has led to a self-service cross-cluster restore capability in Cockroach Cloud, which is uh, you know, a great advancement. So I want to talk a little bit about a customer that does data loss prevention in an AI-native fashion. Uh, and, and in their use case, they saw just uh, repeatedly very unpredictable and high spikes in traffic. So what that means is that their peak load is extremely high compared to their baseline load, which means if you want provisioned hardware to handle that peak, wow, you pay for a lot that you're not using. Because most of the time, you're kind of down at this baseline, and only occasionally do you actually need all the capacity in your system. So that was a, an excellent candidate for our serverless product. But they also needed multi-region, and serverless did not start supporting multi-region. Uh, and, and by the way, multi-region adds another dimension to the cost. So you have these peak loads that are very bursty, and you've got multiple regions. You've got to provision that hardware in each of the regions to handle those bursty loads. Uh, but they still, of course, required a single source of truth in the database. So this promise of serverless was very obvious, but they had these requirements. And this was another one of these examples where making it work well for that one customer really proved the solution. Definitely made it work for one customer, which is a great start. Uh, they helped our, uh, really define our strategy for how we we're going to build multi-region in our serverless product. And uh, for them, uh, secure access became a huge priority. And that was something else we didn't have in serverless yet. So that led us to the right requirements to add private link on a per tenant basis to our serverless. And, and that is actually the beginning of a longer journey. We're going to add uh, all the security features that exist in our uh, you know, dedicated clusters to each of the serverless tenants. That's the direction we're going. Because we want every customer that has a workload that can be bursty or fractional to be able to use this serverless capability to have a really managed TCO and manage many more use cases than just those really mission critical ones that uh, we all know Cockroach is well suited for. This partnership also deepened. They made big contributions to our API around serverless and also our Terraform capabilities. So we learn a lot from our customers, and that advances the state of our product. This is a financial services customer. Financial services is a hugely important vertical for us. Our differentiators are also are often a very exceptional match for what they're looking for, what their requirements are. Uh, they do have stringent requirements. These are routine. Uh, they often are not just in security, but in disaster testing. Uh, there's a very, the requirements are so stringent often that they, they serve as a high watermark. If we can pass uh, the requirements for uh, one of these big financial services customers, uh, it opens the door for many others. So it's a point of credibility, and it also advances us to a point where we're, we're, we're good enough for someone that has uh, excellent um, standards, and uh, I think the rest of the industry takes note. So recent efforts with one of our customers in financial services really stress tested our interactions with some of the uh, infrastructure layers in uh, one of our major cloud service providers. So one of those questions that we ran into is what happens, and this was in early testing. This is kind of what they defined as the, the mark we needed to, to, to meet in terms of uh, quality. What happens when the underlying storage device is faulty? Not just that it has a failure, which is relatively easy to notice, but what happens if it starts to just trickle data? It becomes so slow, it still seems to be operational, and yet your cluster is going to grind to a halt because everything gets backed up trying to access what seems like a healthy disk in a naive perspective, 
But when you, when you look more closely at it, you, you want to understand that sometimes block devices can act in, in a way that you want to treat it as a failure, even if it's not strictly considered one. We always had that capability. We had it when this test was run, but it didn't work well. And it didn't work well because we didn't have a customer that fundamentally needed it. With a customer that fundamentally needed it, they pushed us. They, they raised that bar and made that something that we actually had to excel at. And, and that made us a, a more bulletproof product. Also, what happens if there's multi-region network glitches? It turns out that can be a very difficult problem to diagnose. Uh, whose fault is it? Is it the database's fault? Is there something strange? I mean, there's all kinds of things that can cause cockroach to, to get a, a latency blip. There's a lot of things happening in the system. Is it a glitch? Is it, who's, who, whose concern is it? Is it an environment? Is it a configuration? Is there something weird about the network? This is actually something that caused us to engage in a very painstaking investigation. Uh, many weeks of engineering time, really trying to parse the little bits of signals you can get from the data that you can collect on an event that's very intermittent. Uh, but we, we happily leaned into that. And in this particular case, you know, we, we were able to, to isolate the problem and, uh, and, and show the, the cloud vendor that uh, this is something that's their responsibility, and now they're committed to fixing it. And so it's also understanding that, how do we find the right workaround? So this is a real exercise in uh, successful partnership of uh, you know, really working together to sometimes diagnose problems in our system and sometimes to diagnose problems in the more complex interaction between CockroachDB and our uh, you know, uh, necessary, um, I guess, uh, collaborating vendors. Also, to support rapid deployment from multi-region clusters in this customer, they wanted to really train up their staff. So we had our customer success, our product management teams, and our engineering teams all collaborate on an enablement plan. And we de delivered more than 25 different training sessions and, uh, for over 100 different individuals in this organization. And uh, in the process, with this collaboration of these internal teams at Cockroach that have a lot of knowledge about the system, we were able to really optimize that customer workload. And to support that customer's requirements, <laughs> we, we did a lot of feature work on the database. And again, this is extremely beneficial to us uh, as a company for our product to really advance it. We delivered over 40 features within six months, so it was a very high feature velocity in order to, make, uh, to meet this customer's expectations for the database. This is an on-demand delivery company, and uh, this is about their usage of change data capture at scale. And it's a really fascinating story. Uh, this customer has been one of our truly great partners. Uh, and that's despite, maybe perhaps because of, the fact that we've had plenty of difficult growth pains with this customer. They really, and this defines, I think, their culture, they push the limits of technical systems. Uh, I think to, to an extent that, that surprised us. Uh, and one of the reasons that they feel that they can do that is the same reason they chose CockroachDB, right? They're, they're relying on um, our brand promises around resilience. Uh, this, this interaction, this back and forth, fixing all the different issues that they surface, this is invaluable for bulletproofing our system. Now, often the system worked, but it didn't work so well when a node went away. What this customer really likes to do is routinely and abruptly terminate nodes. So yes, Cockroach can survive that, but it might drop its, uh, you know, some requests for some period of time, or it may uh, experience latency spikes that affect other parts of the system and back things up. Uh, so there was an opportunity to really improve the behavior of CockroachDB in all kinds of edge case scenarios where a node is abruptly terminated instead of just waiting for the rare events where that happens unexpectedly. And one of the great outcomes of this um, is that this, this customer now prefers to do routine maintenance during normal working hours instead of uh, you know, in the dead of night. Uh, because more people are available, you don't have to um, wake people up in order to solve problems. Uh, and that's a direct consequence of them having more trust in the system. And that was, a, that, was a, that was a tough hill to climb, but it was the right one. They also make heavy use of our change data capture. In fact, they've got over 800 change feeds now, and that number is growing. And they have this done at scale. Uh, I will say that um, in the process of using all those change feeds, they really helped us make the, the uh, feature more uh, complete in terms of its capabilities. They helped us with granular metrics. Uh, controls, alerting, filtering messages, so you kind of get just what you need and not all the other dross that's not important. Uh, but they are using change feeds and have been using them at scales that are beyond the design tolerances for that feature. The feature is very complex, and that's part of why we've exceeded the design tolerance in this case. 
Uh, and uh, you know, really, the, the complexity is a result of having a distributed system with many of these little uh, ranges that we use to balance things across the system. Uh, to have all of that give you a consistent view of changes requires a ton of coordination. So we use lots of go routines in there. And so that we've been on this uh, journey with this customer to make that more efficient. And because the, the, the feature is complex, the, the fixes have been complex. So we've been working on a steady iteration of improvements uh, to really make this feature work uh, the way it should in the face of great scale, which is uh, one of the things Cockroach TV is good at. My final one is an online game platform, and, and this company really pushes the limits with performance and scale scalability. They actually have a unique scale and uh, consequent challenges. They have global data centers. They're self-hosted. Uh, these are, these are uh, custom setups, and uh, they, they do that because of their immense scale and the, uh, the benefits of sort of owning that infrastructure themselves. Uh, the critical aspect for them with Cockroach is predictable performance. And also, of course, very, very high QPS in order to serve their users. They have many use cases. Some are well suited to Cockroach. That's where we sort of landed more easily. But there's other ones that really push the limits of CockroachDB. These are higher scales with tighter latency requirements. And recent testing showed some like, really uh, bad discrepancies between the expectations from Cockroach Labs for performance and what they were measuring. So this is another opportunity where our customer success teams and our product management teams and our engineering teams collaborated and partnered with the customer to really investigate what the optimal settings were in this unique environment in order to make Cockroach uh, deliver the performance expected and actually exceed the expected performance. And so some of this was, what are the right cluster sizes for these workloads? What are the environmental settings that optimize the workloads? What are the database configurations? How do you actually tune the existing controls in the database to maximize performance? And also, how can we change the database in order to improve uh, the, the performance of these workloads? And by the way, this is only possible with detailed knowledge of the workload level operations and requirements. So this was a significant investment for us in the partnership. Many, many weeks of engineering and product and CS time. But the critical delivery, uh, deliverable from this process was five times better performance. Uh, and uh, that's both in QPS and in P99 latencies. Also, we demonstrated for them linear scalability from 20 to 200 nodes. So these were some of the requirements that they, they offered up, and uh, we, we were able to exceed them with the benefit of that deep partnership and a lot of the trust and information sharing between the customer and Cockroach Labs. Partnership is really the key to success. We have sometimes talked in the past about uh, you know, how easy Cockroach is to use. Uh, you know, and that, I think, was born of our um, development of our serverless capability, which really is blindingly easy. I mean, you can just get a cluster, many clusters, even for free in seconds. And that part is easy from a certain perspective. But the reality is CockroachDB is a very sophisticated system. It's not a toy. It's not a simple database. It's a sophisticated system. There's definitely ways to use it to have five times better performance or five times worse performance. Right, so with that sophisticated system, it works best with very sophisticated users. But success, no matter how sophisticated we are and how sophisticated you are, success comes most easily when there's a deep um, and committed partnership. My advice is to always let us in. Let us in early. Uh, give us information that we need in order to help you. And that involves a lot of information about the schemas and the workloads. Uh, sometimes there's actually an existing solution. And it's just there, just some knob, some feature to enable that can really uh, solve the problem. Uh, sometimes we have to build to enable that success. But the best solutions present themselves when we have that full information. And also I'll say this, executive touch points are crucial. And we don't do enough of them. But that's something that I really am going to push this year to, uh, to, to lean in on with every one of our customers. Uh, they can really unblock progress when teams are stymied at lower levels. And they're critical for driving alignment in terms of the goals that you have as a customer and the goals that we have as a business. So we look forward to deepening these partnerships with each of you in the year ahead. And now we're going to go on to the main event. Uh, we're going to learn from these incredible customer stories and journeys. And also here are some exciting product innovations from the product team. Our hope is that this conference uh, educates and inspires. So thank you again for participating.